So I'm going to speak about uh, my PhD project, which is focused on the integration of geosciences, and namely, in this case, is geological and petrophysical constraints in uh, geophysical inversion. So in this presentation, I will first uh, highlight some of the motivations for integration in geosciences, and also remain some of the previous work that has been done on these topics. Then uh, I will also explain the I mean, summarize the modeling procedure to do to integrate those petrophysics, geophysics, and geological data together. I will also show some examples that deal with first a very simple proof of concept, and then on a more complex geological, synthetic geological model. And well, I will wrap up the results. Oh, this works. And finally, uh, sorry. And finally, uh, well, I hope we have a discussion together. So let's move to the first part and see the motivation in previous works. So the idea is to integrate petrophysics, geological data, and geological modeling together in a single workflow. So in here, those circles symbolize the possible models that can be inferred from petrophysical, from petrophysical model, geological model, and geophysical model, and geological model. And the idea of integration is to have to narrow down the number of possible models by using the complementarities uh, between the different uh, disciplines of the geosciences because there's just only one Earth. So to do so, what we propose here is to use a statistical framework so that the statistics of petrophysics, geology, and geophysics will be honored at the same time. So that it, also use, uh, it can also be used to estimate the uncertainty and therefore, if you can estimate it better, you can take better decisions and reduce the risks in, in exploration scenarios. So the thing is, these three disciplines, petrophysics, geophysics, and geology, give you different informations at different scales. So in this example, for example, it's a cross plot that was derived from a borehole in northern UK. So you can see that the color, the color gives you different rock types, so you can have uh, the property of the rocks at some specific locations. While on the other hand, geophysics gives you the bulk properties of the medium that is inferred through a physical method, not just measurements like when you look at the samples. And geology is mostly giving you information on the rock types and the structures that are present in the medium you are studying. So the question is, how are you integrating all these three methods together? Well, that's hopefully what we're going to attempt to see today. So first, start with previous work. So this work has been uh, published in 2015 by Zhang and Rivel. So they used geology as a source of prior information, and they discretized the different phase uh into a given number of, of units. So we have, in that case, four units. And each uh, of these units, numbered from one through four, is subject to a petrophysical law that has to be honored uh, during inversion. So in that case, the idea is to honor geology while enforcing a statistic, uh, sorry, uh, an empirical law between resistivity and density in that case, while fitting the geophysical data, so that all three are honored. In that case, you need lots of prior information and to be very confident in your uh, geology, which can be deformed, but not always topology, for example. So the next is like what you can obtain. So you see these faces, the faces are conditioning the geometry of the inverted medium for uh, resistivity and density. And uh, the values inside each phase has been, have been adjusted so that ge geophysics is also honored. Another type of work is dealing only with petrophysics and geophysical data. So the idea in this joint inversion scheme is that you know where your data, sh around where your data should be. So in the case of density and slowness, you know that they should be around here, there, or there. And the inversion algorithm will try to force these data points to be around uh, those values as close as possible by minim minimizing the distance in the inversion scheme. So you it's still using limited statistics, and you don't need much information on geology, just uh, good prior information on those values here. So in here is just a simple synthetic. So this is uh, inversion of slowness data using seismic. And here is the gravity model for those inverting four squares. And here's, the, so that's single domain on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side is the joint inversion using this constraint. So you can see that here, 
you don't honor very well those constraints and this prior information from the petrophysics. But in that case here, you are honoring it because all the inverted points are around those where you want them to be from this prior information. But you, here you don't consider very much geology. So now these guys are considering geology. So Zhu et al. in 2016, it's been published in the April edition of Geophysics. So they, what they do is they assume they know more or less the topology of the geology and they will perturbate it through uh, Monte Carlo simulations and they will test it uh, against geophysics by deriving a covariance matrix from each of these tests. As a result, in their, in their example, they find this geometry to best fit the geophysics and that's the imaging of the properties they obtain after inversion using this coupling between geology and geophysics. So the thing is, you must know a lot about geology and be very confident, and you cannot deform the topologies. But still very, you need a lot of information. You need almost to know the answer already. So on the single domain, say, well, geophysical, uh, geophysics on integration, some people in in invert for several uh, multiple domains at a time. For example, these authors now, they push forward the method and inverted up to four different geophysical techniques at the same time. And the idea behind this is that they will enforce the structural similarity between their models. For example, in this case, which was published by Abu Bakr in 2012, they invert electromagnetic data with uh, seismic data and they enforce the inverted properties to, fit, to have the same geometry. For example, this is p-velocity, this is s-velocity, density, and here is the resistivity. And so the geometry are fitting. The thing is, when the geometry of these two don't fit, which can happen in real life, this uh, type of constraint may encounter difficulties. So that's why there is maybe some uh, more work to do on integration to get, at the same time, consistent geophysics, so robust petrophysics and geology together. So the question is, how do we do this? In the past, there has been some great improvement brought on those three disciplines. So in geology, it's been used as a constraint, which allowed to reduce non-uniqueness. On the petrophysical side, it's been a great improvement to reduce the ill-determination when you constrain the, the values inside your cross-plot to fit predefined in predefined areas. And on the geophysics, there has been a way to invert, at the same time, several data sets through the, impo when you imp through the imposition of uh, those cons structural constraints. So how, but the thing is, all these have weaknesses, and if you want to push forward the integration, you must overcome some of these. So here are some possibilities to advance a bit more in the integration. So to use geology not as a categorical model or discrete description, but to go into a more a statistical description of the model. For what relates to petrophysics, the same, to go more towards respecting, honoring the statistics of the measurements instead of trying to be as close as possible to predefined values. And for geophysics, it is to go still in the same direction to invert several data sets simultaneously, but also to account not only either for geology or petrophysics, but for the statistics of both at the same time and also to be robust to the cases when you have discrepancy, for example, between the magnetic CTBT model and the, or the density contrast. So now we'll go through with the modeling approach. So here's how we use geology. So if you go on the, on the field to collect data, all the data has uh, uncertainty. So the idea to obtain a statistical model is that you would produce, you will enter these uh, measurements with their rated uncertainty into uh, an engine. And this is, by the way, being done by a PhD student at uh, UWA. So this is a quick summary of his project. Stop me, Mark, if I say something wrong <laughs> on this project. But, and uh, so you, once you have this, you can perturbate the, the input data to produce a geological model which would be biased by this error. And by spanning all the ranges of possible error, you can obtain a collection of models that uh, should reproduce all the possible models that, this, that will end up with this specific data set. From this, you can derive a liturgy probability in each cell that gives you an information. For example, if you have like, say, four liturgies here, 
each of them in every cell of the medium will have a given probability of presence. So in that case, we have maybe for the little G1 in red, 0.3, for the green, say 0.2, and so on for all of these. And this will be defined in every part of the medium. So it's very different from, uh, I didn't touch anything. Anyway. It's very different from the best guess model where your best guess is just one model that reproduces the statistics of all the possible models. So now, use of petrophysics. In the past, some people have been doing petrophy petrophysical slash geological differentiation. So they would assume that, for example, if you have a, a point here in the cross plot between property two and property one, there you will belong to the blue cluster, which is not necessarily true. You can be in the blue cluster here, but still have a probability to belong to the black one and to the red one and so on. So the idea when I mention reproducing the statistics is to, to account for this possibility. So that's why uh, uh, petrophysics is formulated as a sum of normal distributions that will say look like this and reproduce the statistics that you measure in your, uh, like you can, sorry, that you can infer from the cross plot using data acquired say on the field in borehole surface, anything that you can collect. And for what relates to the use of geophysics. Well, usually it's like you have a source of prior information. It can be, oh, I see an outcrop here, I see a fault. So you can put this into your starting model for, for the ge geophysical inversion. Then you will also need geophysical data that you will feed into a geophysical inversion code, so it's the engine, that will end up with a, an updating model that would fit with, that would account for this prior information and honor as good as, as well as possible the geophysical data. You can give it so, uh, constraints that come from external sources of information. Like you can lock some parts if the geologist is very sure of what there is here or there. Or as I've shown before, you can apply petrophysical constraints when you say you should go in this cross plot and go here and there as much as you can. So that was it for the use of the different disciplines in this workflow which can be summarized here. So you have source of information which is not geophysical, such as the petrophysical data, some geophysical prior knowledge in the form of uh, edge relationship and everything you need to describe a model that you will feed into the Monte Carlo simulations. From this, you obtain a statistical geological model. Using petrophysical data, you can derive global petrophysical constraints, which you can feed into a constraint inversion and first, and then into the joint inversion where you will integrate several geophysical domain, in this case, gravity and, mag gravity and magnetics. And then you can also use the constraints from geology and geophysics. So you don't have to, this is a bit how I, I, write, the, I write down the equations, but you don't have to read them just to highlight with colors the fact that in the function that has to be optimized to fit everything, I mean all the three disciplines, you have the contribution from geophysical data, which you are going to, to optimize here. You have the contribution from geology, and here the contribution from petrophysics, which is also uh, encapsulating geology, but that's something we'll see later. So here's again the formulation of the petrophysical constraints in the form of uh, normal distributions to, that describes the statistics. So here is, is a very important slide. It's how uh, geology and petrophysics are integrated together. So here again, I repeat, is the global petrophysical constraints is when you have this function, which is just basically reproducing your cross, the statistics of your cross plot, which is applied to the whole of the medium. While what I call geology petrophysic constraints is when, you, you, when I take into account the results from the Monte Carlo simulations on geophysics, on, sorry, on geology, so the statistical geological model, which I uh, use to condition the petrophysical, uh, the petrophysical data. So in that case, for example, we extract one given cell of the geological model for which you have a given lithology probability for each of the, each of the, of the facies. And you can use these probabilities to assign weights into the petrophysics at this very location. So for example, in this case, the red one, with this, the red facies or the red, uh, the red lithology would affect, uh, uh, assign a weight 
to this uh, cluster here. The black one will assign this weight to this cluster here, and so on for the blue and for the green. And this would be based on the geology. So this distribution will be different, say, if I move cell, because you have more chances to be in a different consideration, configuration in terms of rock types. So there will be one uh, specific set of constraints for every cell based on where you are in the geological model. So if, for example, if you are, oh, sorry, if you are very close to the surface, the uncertainty will be very low. Maybe you have almost 100% chances to have, for example, the red rock here. So this one will dominate everything else, and the chances to move away from this during inversion will be very slow, very low. Sorry, but if you are very close, if you are very deep, and you you have very basically no information, that would be entirely different, and there will be equal probability probably between all of these, or just a higher probability to have the basement, and uh, the cluster corresponding to the basement will be boosted in terms of importance during the uh, the joint inversion. This, is, this procedure is illustrated here. So this is a simulation for a very simple model. You have an encasing host rock. You have a small body close to the surface and a bigger body deeper. So the simulation of this multicolor outcome is shown here. And the color scale gives you the, the probability of having the corresponding rock. So for example, if you are here in the corner, you have 100% chances to have the host rock. While if you go closer to this zone here, you increase the chances of having this small body here. And this is uh, done for the whole medium. So an example is you extract, again, one cell here. You have the weights assigned by the probabilities that you can see here. And that gives you, uh, say, a kind of spe cell-specific distribution. So in that case, you have more probabilities to have this rock. But this one and this one here is still, is still possible. For example, if the best choice is this one, but it doesn't improve the geophysical data fit, then the code will try to move probably maybe in this direction. And if the going in this direction is improving the data fit, then it may stick to it, even if the, this one should be the predominant. So there will be a narrow, like adapting the model based on several sources of information. So, well, something might be wrong here. But this part, this is again the idea is to show what relates to what. So this is uh, the model update. So how the model is updated uh, iteratively. So each iteration you are supposed to go closer to the final solution. And here, so that's the, say, the traditional quasi-Newton uh, method for minimizing the cost function I was showing before. For those who are interested, there is no damping here, and we don't use tick on off, for example, because no regularization as it's adding uh, artificial sources of information, which we don't want here as we are trying to capture everything from the different geosciences. So those terms, are, this term is relating to geophysics. This one also here is related to the update and the geology, and that's the petrophysical constraint, which is when using geology, a mix between geology and geophysics. After inversion is done and the algorithm has converged, we analyze the results at a posteriori to try to quantify uh, the convergence, if it converged well, if it didn't, and, and so on. So for what relates to statistics, uh, we calculate the joint petrophysical geological likelihood. So it's basically the value of the condition petrophysical. Uh, I'm sorry for this. Uh, function. We also calculate the fissure information to try to assess the curvature around the minimum of this function. And the score, and I'm just mentioning it in this one, but not using it, not showing anything writing to this, uh, in this presentation. So before, valid, before using a flow, uh, it has to be validated. So in this case, uh, we, what I did is I tested every step of integration, going from the single domain unconstrained inversion. So in the example I'm going to show, first you run separately gravity and magnetic uh, inversion without uh, prior information, just a very simple starting model, no constraint. Then still at single domain, applying only the petrophysics but without the geology. So it's one constraint applied for the whole, the whole of the medium, no spatial uh, constraints. Then uh, running it uh, in a joint inversion. So you, the, the idea is to run 
jointly geology, uh, sorry, magnetic and uh, gravity inversion, but with only one function, so no, without the geology, only the petrophysics. Then is the, to integrate geology, petrophysics, and geophysics together. So in single domain, so for example, running gravity inversion with uh, geology and petrophysics. And the final stage is the joint inversion with geology and petrophysics. So in this the example I'm going to show is uh, gravity data, magnetic data with uh, petrophysical constraints that are conditioned by the geology especially. So first, I will show a proof of concept on the very simple model and then go on something a bit more realistic. So that's a very simple model I was speaking about. So still, like with the two bodies, one with a bigger uh, density contrast and which also has a higher uh, magnetic susceptibility. It's all encased in a homogeneous host rock and with a bigger body which shows lower contrast and also lower uh, magnetic susceptibility. Here is an example, the same example as before actually, where of uh, petrophysical uh, constraints for one given cell. This is what we apply in this, to this medium for constraints. So here's the integration flow. So at the, at the top, uh, you have the case where no constraints are applied, and then you increase the level of constraints from no constraint, just single domain petrophysical constraints, joint inversion petrophysical constraints, then petrophysical conditioning, so it's petrophysics and geology applied in single domain. And finally, when you have petrophysical conditioning, so petrophysical, petrophysics and geology applied to joint uh, inversion of gravity and magnetics. This column shows density contrast and this one magnetic susceptibility. So what we can see is for density contrast without constraints, if you don't scale the color bar, the colors, you don't see much. You just see something very smeared for even for the small body close to the surface and something even more smeared for the bigger one. But, as, but when you apply the petrophysical constraints, you start to retrieve a bit better the, the geometry. But the thing is, the code gets trapped in a local minimum. So it goes in the wrong place in the cross plot. That's why you have a discrepancy on the, on the values for the small body. Same up here as here. You define a bit better the bigger body, but not amazing. <coughs> Same here, you improve a bit, but there's still room for improvement. So then, when you run the joint inversion with global petrophysics, you see a big improvement. You retrieve the, the values inside the small body much better, and this is applied to both, because when you have, in that case, joint inversion, it's also enforcing structural similarity when it can, because it will go in the right cluster, not because it's uh, explicit uh, constraint on geometries. When uh, playing the petrophysical conditioning on single domain, there's a, an improvement on the bigger square, but not so much in the small square. But what is not very visible here is that the values inside are better than and here. And same here, it's not much of an improvement. But when you combine petrophysics and geology into joint inversion, then you see that there's a big, it's, much, it's better because the values inside the square are so better honored and the geometry is quite improved if you compare with what we had at the top. So it's an example of uh, simple runs. So here is uh, with fewer constraints in the cross plot of magnetic susceptibility with uh, density contrast on the axis. The color gives the value obtained by the likelihood after the inversion. So you see uh, here it's still pretty low and that the dots are outside where the petrophysics says because the contour lines here show the contour lines obtained from the statistics of the petrophysics. But when you run with joint inversion and petrophysical constraints conditioned by geology, what you obtain is that first you can see the correlation between gravity and magnetics because those uh, Gaussians are tilted here, so you, you honor this as well. And you also increase the likelihood of your, uh, the inverted properties. <laughs> So it means that you are not only honoring the petrophysics, but also the geology through uh, the likelihood. So now it's uh, what I was referring to as the more complex model, which has been obtained through the Monte Carlo simulation I was uh, saying earlier. 
So this data has been simulated using uh, geological data obtained, collected at the Mansfield area in Victoria. So this is the true, what we call the true model from which the simulations are made. So in this example, I'm going to show, to show you the example on 2D, which is extracted along the black line here uh, from top view and here on 3D. And there are six rock types in this model, which are labeled here. And the inversions and the modeling are carried uh, using this, uh, this model. Well, you see you can ba see basement. There has been some folding and com more complex structures here, while on this side it's more simple, like with a basin. So the rock types one through six show this probability, which are shown here on the color scale. So you can see that in that case, in here, in this area there, it's becoming a bit more complex, and you span basically all the, all the possibilities in the sense that you have zero, close to zero percent of having rock three here, but you go as high as 90 something there. So you have like lots of various level of constraints for each of the rocks. So here's the, the models I used to simulate the geophysics. So gravity model, true model and magnetics. So you have the density contrast varying between zero and 300 and for magnetic for my for magnetic sensitivity it ranges between 0 and 0 0.75 so as you can see the geometries don't fit like here there is no interface in the gravity contrast model but here you can see you can see it on the magnetic susceptibility and same here the basin has mostly uh, no density contrast while there is a little bit of uh, magnetic sensitivity here so now we'll go through the same sequence of uh, integration steps. So first, when there is no constraints, and here I show the control, the interfaces in the gravity model. So we see that it's very smear. There is not much interface. You can see very little, still little information. You say, okay, there is a bigger body here, probably basin, but that's all you can derive from this. Same, same on the magnetic. You can see some stuff. Maybe there is some dipping body here and there but you cannot say much. Then when you apply the uh, petrophysics alone, you, you start to see a bit more interfaces that are more clear because you want the dots to be where they belong in the, in the cross plots. But still, you don't fit very well, you don't retrieve very well all the interfaces. So, well, it's still an, there's still, it's an improvement, but there's room for more improvement. You just see the very big structures. So now when you run the, pet the petrophysics without the geology into joint inversion, you obtain this model here. So what you can see is that you start to retrieve more structures, like you find this yellow one here. Here there is a bit more complexity, but it's also complex in the true model. Even if you, you miss this one here, this dipping blue body in the gravity doesn't appear. And same here, it's thought to be there, but it's not quite. So there's still room for improvement. So now that's the, that's the run with uh, single domain inversion, but with petrophysics and geology. So for, for gravity, it's much better now. We still miss some part here. There's a next, the layer here should not be, but the geometry of all is pretty well retrieved. Same for uh, magnetics. Even if you, this yellow uh, body could dip a bit more, and here we miss this uh, thin layer, horizontal layer. It's just not seen by geophysics in that case. But see what ha now we'll see what happens when we have joint inversion with petrophysics conditioned by geology. So everything integrated together, which is the final product of this joint inversion workflow. And this is what we obtain. Well, it was a bit fast. So we see that from if you compare on the gravity side here, and there you dig a bit more to extend the blue dipping body and you also get this, uh, this uh, interface a bit better. While if you look at what you obtain on the gravity side, on the magnetic side, uh, you improve this uh, well, banana shaped body, dipping body, and you, this part is retrieved because there is some cross torque doing joint inversion here and there. It's uh, pushed by the complementarity between, gravi between gravity and magnetics in the petrophysical domain. So this 
this, this is supposed to show the improvement you get from no integration to the max integration this workflow can do. So if you look at this from a different uh, perspective in the cross-plot domain, so on the, ah, sorry, on the horizontal axis, you get density contrast and magnetic susceptibility. So it's plotting the result that I was showing on cross-section just in the cross-plot. And the color is showing the likelihood. So it's the value of taken by the PDF that describes the data in the cross-plot domain. So you can see that when there is no constraint, it's fairly low, except when by chance you hit the centers of the cluster where you want to be, which are shown uh, by the contour lines here. So this is what is reproducing the statistics of the petrophysics. So then when you move to the petrophysical inversion single domain without the geology, you start to get into the maximum probability spots, but you still miss because there's an ambiguity along this line or along this line. But when you do joint inversion, then you lose this ambiguity because if you want to maximize the function, then you have to be in here. That's the case when you, have, uh, you are doing joint inversion, not single inversion. And this is what we can see here. When there is, uh, so which corresponds to, gravi to separate inversion for gravity and magnetics with petrophysics and geology. So you have an improvement with regard to this case because you have geology guiding the inversion, but you are still subject to the ambiguity here and there where you have low, lower likelihood even if you get closer to the centers when, when you get in. And from what comes the final product, which is the case when you have joint inversion of gravity magnetics with uh, petrophysics and geology, then you obtain this, uh, this case where all the, dots, the, all the data points are inside the maximum probability spots. And you also see the correlation in the vertical between gravity and magnetics, which should be like a bit tilted like that. It's, I mean, it's just specific to this uh, scenario. So and if you look com uh, in a compact way, here's the um, likelihood values that I was showing on the cross plot, but plotted in a box plot for, again, increasing level of integration. So you see that when there is no integration, no, no integration is very broad. Same when you just do petrophysics on single domain. But as soon as you get either to joint inversion or to petrophysics and geology together, you decrease it, uh, you decrease the range of values very much, and you increase all, by a lot the, the likelihood. So as, a, as, a, as I was mentioning, we also plotted, I also plotted the Fisher information, which is shown here at the bottom. And in this case, the circle size is uh, proportional to the model fit. So it's the, how close your model is from the true model, the model that I was showing before. And so we can see that the Fisher information on the magnetic susceptibility here and the one on the density contrast there is decreasing with uh, increasing level of, uh, of integration, which means that uh, we are more certain of the final result as there is less curvature around the local minimum where we end up after the inversion. So to close the, this, this, this part, here is a prospective case study where we, that's an example of what we can use the code for. So in that case, it's uh, within the Irida basin, which is located more or less in the middle of WA. So you have this basin here where you don't have much deposits. As you can see here, all those dots are deposits that have been found by various exploration uh, campaigns. But here there is nothing because as was uh, uh, published by Pierre Agenot in, uh, in 1998 and Pierre Agenot and Oki in 2000. Uh, the, the body where the interface where all these deposits were found is dipping and under, uh, under a basin, which is the radar basin. And the idea is to use this methodology to say, okay, we know it's dipping, but how, how much is it dipping? And also how sure are we? to maybe find prospects, for example, along those lines where you have like lots of deposits have been found, but because it starts to dip, we lose the, there has been no discoveries because of this body that is on top of them. So, and this can be also a good case study to start because the geology, as you can see here, is 
fairly simple while around it's more complicated just because you have like simply a uh, basin overlaying those uh, possible deposits. So hopefully for you, it's going to finish soon. Uh, so yeah, I was saying we tested it on a complex, complex semi-complex synthetics. We showed that we have, we have seen the results when you in, uh, increase the integration level are improving. And uh, maybe that's a big statement to say that we have higher degree of integration than other workflows, but it's consistently, if I may say, integrating petrophysics, uh, uh, geophysics, and geology together to reproduce statistics, not using best guess or manual tuning of the button, but just, yeah, reproducing statistics. Well, I guess it's time. Yeah, try also to address some of the weaknesses of previous work. It's not exactly weaknesses, it's stuff that were not addressed at the time. And the thing is, what I've been showing is just small models at the time, and we should start to also to investigate the case studies such as what I've just shown the, in the Yerida Basin. Uh, complexify a bit the petrophysics, and also to highlight this, that in the case, petrophysics is not as nice as the one I've been using here. Uh, maybe geology is, can be very useful, and as well, because gravity and magnetics are very non-unique, a good idea would also be to integrate maybe a third method into it to narrow down, again, the number of models that can be used. So just to acknowledge few people I had good interaction with, an interesting discussion, so Jeff Schrag from UWI, Desmond Fitzgerald from, from Interpreet, Chris Vision from the first quantum minerals, and Andre Bill from the University of Savoie in France. And well, data we use for geological modeling was from Victoria, so thanks to them we got, did, got it. Just a few references that are interesting to this work. And yeah, that's just, if you want to have a better look at what I've published till now on this paper, on this uh, subject. So, if you have any question, I thank you for your attention.